A new book looks at the multiple causes of this and calls the whole thing an American sickness. It's the focus of our report from economics correspondent Paul Solman. It's part of his weekly series, Making Sense. If you have high blood sugar, ask your doctor about Farsiga. Diarrhea and abdominal pain. Feel like you're seeing more prescription drug ads lately? Well, you are. Side effects including dehydration, swelling, bruising, and or diarrhea, numbness, gas, and runny nose. Spending on pharmaceutical ads is up 62% since 2012, in the world's only country besides New Zealand to even allow TV drug advertising. Lynn's S works differently from laxatives. Pills for millions of us. It can help relieve your belly pain. Pills for far fewer. A circadian rhythm disorder. But regardless, the drug companies charge pretty much whatever they want. In fact, says Elizabeth Rosenthal, When one manufacturer puts a price up to a new high level, everyone else just says, oh look, um, he got away with it, and lifts their prices up to that level too. A journalist and former practicing physician, she's now editor-in-chief of Kaiser Health News, Rosenthal has written a new book, An American Sickness, chronicling how and why American health care costs are by far the highest in the world. It boils down to one basic truth. Prices will rise to whatever the market will bear. And while the health care market in the U.S. isn't exactly a free market, it's market-driven enough to push profits above all, and thus the prices we all wind up paying. And so, as a consequence, we spend 20 percent of our entire GDP, our entire economic output every year on health care. Yeah. And it's been going up. We spend two or three times what other countries do on health care without getting better results, which is the, the, the key here. We're not getting a good deal for all the money we spend. We're not living longer. We're not living longer. I think one of the most damning studies I've seen recently was that uh, people with cystic fibrosis, which is a, a very serious, primarily lung disease, live longer in Canada than they do in the U.S. And this is a treatment-heavy disease with a lot of technology, new medicines, and we like to think, well, at least we do that better yes, than yes. everywhere else in I, the I world. I thought that. We don't, but we sure pay more for it. Why? Because of what the market will bear, says Rosenthal, but also because... Around the world, there are very few developed places perhaps none that have no mechanism for some kind of price control. I think we're really? pretty unique in that. Other countries will say, here's the maximum price. Go ahead and compete below that. And in other countries, there's policy that you can charge a lot when you have a wonderful new technology, but as it gets older, that price has to keep coming down. And what we see in the United States pretty much uniquely is as technologies get older, Sometimes the price can go up, and can go up a lot. Case in point, MRI scan, yes, okay. a now venerable procedure which can still cost thousands of dollars. In Japan, that same test would cost 100 to 150 dollars, because in Japan, those prices have to go down over time. You can't say, wow, this was a great new technology 30 years ago, and uh, so <laughs> we're going to raise the price because it's even greater now. It's not. It's basically the same. Or consider Gleevec, a breakthrough cancer drug when it was approved by the FDA in 2001. Fifteen years later, the price is four times what it was when it came on the market. $120,000 a year, despite so-called copycat Gleevex and even off-patent generic versions. So how come? We're stuck buying American, even though the price of pharmaceuticals in other countries is a third to a half of what we pay here, and sometimes way less. There's one wonderful story in the book about an oncologist, Dr. John Siebel, who his grandkids had pinworm. 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 It's a little infection that kids get. Right. The drug for that, which is called albendazole, um, in the rest of the world cost pennies, and it used to cost pennies here too. Mm -hmm. But when he went online to, to check out the prescription, it costs something like five dollars a pill so he ordered it from Canada. And was it legal to do that? It's technically illegal. Um, it, so you're outing him here <laughs> in the book I mean and now I you're am, on but, television? But, but I think a lot of people are so outraged right now. You know he's not a criminal normally but he's just <laughs> like this is extortion I'm not gonna pay. Extortion because we don't allow foreign competition do allow healthcare providers to consolidate from ever bigger pharma 
to ever bigger hospitals. In the 80s and 90s, there was consolidation of hospitals. And a lot of those in the early phases um, were about efficiency. But at a certain point, consolidation in local markets becomes effectively monopoly. And this is a classic dilemma of mergers and acquisitions, exactly. right? You acquire another company because you will then have market power to buy things in bulk and therefore more cheaply, and you won't be repeating the things that you each individually were doing. Right. But then, if there are no competitors left, you can charge whatever you want. Right. And we have reached the level of consolidation in many markets in healthcare where there isn't effectively competition. And as providers consolidate, so do payers. There are now just five mega health insurers. And only that many because judges blocked Anthem's $48 billion deal to buy Cigna, Aetna's $37 billion bid for Humana. Yes, insurers have an interest in paying as little as possible, but that interest has evolved into a nightmare cat and mouse game between insurers and providers. In Rosenthal's book, it's one of the rules of what she calls the dysfunctional medical market. There are no standards for billing. There's money to be made in billing for anything and everything. Ah, so this is what you get charged for, it, even if the doctor only says, hi, how you doing, see you later. Billing and collections became an industry. We started using codes for medical billing. Um, and, and that has spawned this crazy, crazy industry. So they actually take every little service your doctor did. They take all those little things. The Khan Academy tries to explain it all in a 12-minute online tutorial that, as Rosenthal points out, is five minutes longer than its video explaining Newton's second law of motion. It's endlessly complex, so that now there are coding degrees and coding specialists and professors of coding. The insurers have coders to make sure the hospitals are coding correctly. Uh, the doctors learn coding so they can make sure their office will get the money they deserve for what they've done. But isn't insurance the problem here? Since we're not paying for things ourselves, we don't care what the drugs cost, what the procedures cost. Well, when insurance was covering everything, no one cared. Everyone was right. price insensitive. So we should have skin in the game. So skin in the game has worked in other countries where prices are controlled. Mm -hmm. But a 10% copayment on an MRI that's billed for $10,000, your copayment is $1,000. Mm -hmm. And we're no longer talking skin in the game. We're talking, I like to say, a kidney in the game, you know. <laughs> Or you're getting skinned. Oh, right. Last question. We spend about $3 trillion on health care in this country. If we rationalize the system so that it was no more expensive given the same level of outcome as, say, Germany, mm -hmm. we'd shave a trillion or two off the number, right? Hey, at this point, even if we stopped going up, <laughs> it would be a great achievement. You know, start turning the ship around, get back to 2.5 you know, trillion. That would still be more than anyone else spends per capita. But that's a half a trillion dollars that wouldn't go to right. doctors, hospitals, insurers, investors. Yes, yeah, somebody's got to take the hit. But right now, you know, I think a lot of the political people, the congressmen, the senators, are responding to lobbying from pharma, from the hospital industry, from insurers. And it, it's so much not about what's good for health care and so much about what's good for revenue.